Romans 11, verses 22 through 27. Behold then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from that which is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will those who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we are just so grateful for what you have revealed to us. There are, we know that it is your prerogative to both reveal and conceal matters. And yet you have been pleased to reveal these truths to us. And I pray that the knowledge of these things would have their intended result. Certainly among those intended results are heap loads of humility and hope. I pray, Lord, that your people would be filled with both this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, so far in our study through Romans 11, we have seen that Israel's rejection is partial in verses 1 through 6. We saw that Israel's rejection is punitive in verses 7 through 10. We saw that Israel's rejection is purposeful the last couple of weeks in verses 11 through 22. And today we're going to begin the final point that Paul makes regarding Israel's rejection, and that is Israel's rejection is passing. Israel's rejection is passing, starting here in verse 23 of chapter 11. Paul pulls no punches when handling difficult subjects. He knew that the widespread Jewish rejection of Jesus was sure to make waves. There were a lot of antagonists of the gospel who argued that this sweeping rejection must provide evidence against the gospel's authenticity and its authority. If Jesus was indeed the Messiah, didn't so much Jewish opposition create problems for God's covenant with Israel and his promises with them? In reply, Paul has provided a very robust answer that we've been seeing from chapter 9 all the way here to chapter 11. Among the things that he has said is that God's work of redemption from the very beginning never implied that every single person born from Abraham would him or herself inherit the promises and blessings of the covenant. Simply consider the case of Ishmael and Esau. Again, this is Paul's argument for Romans 9. Isaac, not Ishmael. Jacob, not Esau. God's promises do not hinge on perfect Jewish assent. In other words, not all Jews have to agree in order for God's promises to be fulfilled. In fact, Israel had a long history of rejecting God's prophets and word. This is why Paul can mention the dark days of Israel during the, the time of Elijah when so much of the, the nation of Israel had gone after false gods. Remember Elijah in that one scene is like, am I alone left? And the Lord says, no, you're not. I've got hundreds that have not bowed the knee to Baal. God throughout history has had a remnant, and Paul's day was no different. Even though there was significant opposition to Jesus and that in him being the Messiah by many Jews, Paul was not alone the only Jewish believer in Christ. Thousands of Jews had been saved. Many had repented of their sin and called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Israel's rejection, as we saw together, was partial. It was not total. And God had a purpose even in the Jewish rejection we looked on further. It provided a unique opportunity for Gentile inclusion in the kingdom of God. 
It led to increased mission work among the Gentiles because the rejection and persecution that the Jews had towards believing Jews caused those believing Jews to be pushed outward. That persecution pushed those Jews outward with the gospel to Gentile audiences. Paul himself repeated that pattern in his gospel ministry. He would go to a town, start shop in the synagogue, and after increased Jewish resistance happened there, he would go out from the synagogue and start speaking to more and more Gentiles. But Paul goes on to say in this passage that marvelously, even this increased Gentile work would itself rebound to Jewish blessing as it provoked Jews to jealousy. It would make them reconsider their position before the Almighty God. Paul indicated that God was at work expanding his church in such a way that a great incoming of Gentiles would in turn precipitate a great incoming of Jews. So Jewish rejection in the present was leading to expanded ministry among the Gentiles and eventually expanded ministry among the Gentiles and Gentiles entering into the kingdom would precipitate a great future incoming of Jews. The Gentiles are even further assured by Paul here that if the rejection of the Jews right now has meant your blessing, you better believe that the inclusion of the Jews at the end of history will mean unparalleled blessing, unprecedented blessing upon the whole world. Last week, we considered Paul's pastoral aside to this discussion. Paul emphasizes that God is sovereign over the composition of his church. He is building his church, and it's made up of people of every tribe, tongue, and nation. Jews and Gentiles are welcomed in and share the same root and become beneficiaries of all the riches that God gives to his covenant people. It was wrong for the Jews to look down on Gentiles as dogs or as second-class citizens. And so Paul goes to great lengths to establish that Gentiles who believe become partakers of all the blessings that come with being in God's family. But there was a danger the Gentiles might also then respond sinfully, thinking themselves to somehow be superior to the Jews since they had received Jesus the Messiah while many Jews had rejected him. So Paul reminds the Romans that they had their own standing only by faith. And that faith, a gift from God. Their rags to riches story from wild branch to grafted in branch into the cultivated olive tree ought not lead them to pride and arrogance. For certainly if God had broken off natural branches, there ought to be an attitude of humility and gratitude among wild branches that are now grafted in. Everyone in Christ is supported by the roots, not the other way around. We don't hold up the tree. Christ holds up the tree. It's God's tree that we've been grafted into by God's power. All of us owe every spiritual blessing we have to God's grace. We ended last week with the command, Behold, or look, therefore, at the kindness and severity of God. Whenever we get a big head, we're given two prescriptions. Remember who you are. Don't forget that your finitude. Don't forget your unworthiness. Don't forget that your standing before God is by God's grace alone. And secondly, remember whose you are. Remember, don't forget the marvelous nature and character of the God who saved you, who displays his perfect severity in just judgment falling upon sinners, as well as his perfect kindness in choosing to save sinners from that coming judgment. We're going to spend the majority of our time considering verses 25, 26, and 27 together this morning. But before I do that, I want to take just a couple of moments to consider what's said in verses 22 through 24. Um, likely, I maybe if it wasn't for the sake of time issues, I might have included this into last week's sermon. I just couldn't quite fit it in. And so I want to just say a couple of things about verses 22 through 24, and then we're going to spend the rest of our time in verses 25, 26, and 27. Let's read 22 through 24 together again. Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell severity, but to you God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness... Otherwise, you also, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from that which is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, 
how much more will those, these who are the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? I really just want to say, make two comments about this. There's more that could be said, but I'll confine my thoughts to two things. The first is this. Notice that phrase, God is able to graft them in again. Let's pause it for a minute. God is able. God is powerful. God has the ability to do something that no one else can. And what is that ability? It's to save. God alone is the one that exercises the power to save. And notice here, he is able to graft them, speaking of the Jewish people, graft them in again. God is powerful to accomplish whatever he desires. So certainly, if God can graft wild branches onto his tree, certainly he can graft back onto the tree a natural branch. If God can save Gentile outsiders, then certainly he can turn back the hearts of Israelite insiders. This is the point that's being made. It's an argument from greater to lesser. He brought you guys in who are without hope and without God in the world. Don't get a big head about this. Certainly, if he does that with you, he could turn his own people back to him again. He's able. He's powerful to do it. The second thing I want to mention is this. There are some who have looked at this passage and this warning and have said that it's only valid to give a warning like this if there's the actual possibility of someone losing their justified status before God. Notice here he says, take heart that you not be cut off. So people would look at this and go like, oh, hey, here's, here's an example of how it's possible for us to lose our salvation. If the warning exists, then the possibility of losing your salvation must exist as well. People arguing this point would point to other scriptures as well. Um, just to give you a sampling, they might point to 1 Timothy 1, 18 and 19, where Paul says to Timothy, his son, in accordance with prophecies previously made to him, that he fight the good fight, that he keep the faith and a good conscience. And then he goes on to say, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Again, somebody who says you can lose your salvation might point to a text like that. A little bit later in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, but the Spirit explicitly says in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Uh, other passages that are often pointed to in this regard, a um, couple from Hebrews, Hebrews 6, verse 4 and following, Hebrews 10, verses 28 and following, this uh, statement like, how much severe do you think uh, he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he is sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace? Each of these passages, I just want to mention because I don't have time to handle them in detail here this morning, but each of these passages do need to be handled in turn. Um, whenever we're Studying the Word of God, it is never appropriate to just cut verses out of the Bible or just ignore them. They all have to be understood in light of one another. Um, that's what we believe in sola scriptura, right? Scriptures interpret scripture, and so we must take these arguments to heart and consider them and see what, they, what they're saying here. I do think there are very good answers as to what's going on in each of those passages. And again, if you'd like to sit down with me and talk about them further, I would love to have a conversation with you. Please let me know. Um, but... I don't believe that that's the point that any of those verses is making, nor do I think that's the point that's being made here in Romans 11. And I'm not trying to deny those verses exist. They do exist. But I think there's sufficient explanation and sufficient grounds for understanding those verses in light of other very, very clear scripture statements made regarding the certainty, the assurance that is provided to believers regarding their salvation. Even if your assurance wanes, your salvation is never in doubt and the reason why is because it's ultimately God who saves. You see, if it was ultimately up to you, then you could lose salvation. But if salvation is God's work, then what stops God from saving that which he's chosen to save? You see, the primary reason that there are so many, message, there's so many pa passages that make clear that salvation is not up for grabs, here's just a couple of lines of argument. God's people are given what? Eternal life. And when are you given that? At the moment of conversion. When does eternal life end? If you've been given eternal life, it's forever. And you enter into eternal life in Jesus Christ. Eternal life is knowing God. And it happens through Jesus Christ. So that never is lost to us. You can never lose eternal life. If you've been given eternal life, you have it forever. It's a life that never ends. Second line of argument. God's people are saved and kept by God's power and grace. 
There are certainly several wonderful passages that highlight this idea. I direct your attention to John 6, verses 37 through 40. Or John 10, verses 22 through 30. These images of um, us being held in God the Father's hand and Jesus' hand. We're being clasped and held on to. Jesus isn't going to lose any of his sheep. I also point you to 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 23 and 24. Or for that matter, just turn a few pages back to Romans 8. Consider the glorious nature of the certainty of salvation as Romans 8 portrays it. Think about the fact that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, So anyway, go ahead and take a look at Romans 8 some more. We certainly took our time preaching through Romans 8, so you could go listen to those again. Another line of argument that I would make is that the Holy Spirit is the sign and seal of the guarantee of our eternal inheritance. See Ephesians 1 and 1 Peter 1. That point is made brilliantly there. The Holy Spirit is the down payment, the guarantee, the seal that God the Father will ultimately redeem those whom he has rescued and saved. And if the Holy Spirit is involved, just as the Father and the Son are involved, notice that salvation is a Trinitarian work. God does not fail to accomplish what he has set out to do. Now, this is the problem with positions that consider salvation to rest in your hands, because if it does rest in your hands, then it is a very fickle thing indeed. First of all, you couldn't save yourself in the first place. That's just a fool's errand. But second of all, if you could, how would you hold on? You see, Christian assurance rests in the certainty that God holds that which he saves, that which he redeems, he keeps. Jesus died and shed his blood to forgive their sins. God the Father has accepted that as payment in full. He won't go back on that. That would be to slight the sacrifice of Jesus, which God the Father will not do. There's many more things that could be said. But if this is the case, if salvation is not losable, then it brings us back to the question, well, then what is it talking about here? What is Paul saying here? Well, I think one of two options seem reasonable to me. I would be fine with either of these. And it could be a combination even of these perhaps going on. First is this. God's people persevere because God preserves them. And perhaps one of the ways that God preserves them is through warnings like these, which the elect take to heart and live in light of. The only people who are truly concerned about being cut off due to arrogance are those who are God's people already. <laughs> The only people who will really be concerned about this. The second thing I could say is this. The warning may exist because it's a litmus test for those who truly are God's people. You see, from the human perspective, there might be people who are cut off from the church, who otherwise looked like as if they were in the church, but I would argue were never truly grafted in. It's just that, that man, from man's perspective, There can be many who make false professions to be Christians. Think about 1 John 2.19. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. If they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that they would be shown that they are not of us. Now, why does this point make particular sense here? Because consider the Israelite condition. So what does Jesus do when he arrives on the scene? He's the ultimate litmus test, right? Those who hear the words of Jesus are Jesus' sheep and therefore God's people. Those who reject the words of Christ are not God's people. So you have all of Israel who consider themselves to be what? God's people. But what does Jesus do when he arrives? We determine real quickly who are the sheep and who are the goats. And so similarly, I think a passage like this, what Paul's saying is just like Jesus is the is the dividing line, is the one that makes clear who it is that are his and who are not. So that happens within even the assembled church. There are people who come to church on a Sunday morning who might not know Jesus. They might even declare themselves to be Christian, but they don't actually know Christ. And so it might be the very fact that their pride and arrogance shows themselves to not actually be God's people because God's people will be humbled and grateful for what God has done for them in salvation. And so they might be cut off or removed from the fellowship through God's just judgment. More can be said here, and 
please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you'd like to have a further chat about these verses or about the doctrine of, it's usually referred to as the uh, perseverance of the saints. Some people like to say preservation of the saints. I think both are, are true. Uh, the more classic, you know, in Baptist circles is once saved, always saved. You know, you've heard that before, I'm sure. Yeah, and, um, and, that, and, that, and that's a true statement. Um, but what's important is that that be grounded in a fuller theology, right? The reason why we can say once saved, always saved is because what we know about the God who saves. For our purposes, though, this morning, I want to spend the rest of our time looking at verses 25 through 27 in a sermon entitled, Israel's Rejection is Passing. Two things I want to note. The first is this. Here we have a revelation that checks pride. A revelation that checks pride. I'll say curbs pride, if you like that better, or demolishes pride, if you like that better. There's a danger here of being uninformed. Look at verse 25. I do not want you to be uninformed of this ministry. This is not the only time Paul uses a phrase like this. Romans 1.13, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren. 1 Corinthians 10.1, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren. 1 Corinthians 12.1, not concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. 2 Corinthians 1.8, for we do not want you to be unaware, brethren. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so you will not grieve as those, as the rest who have no hope. Paul here is about to deliver a prophecy, a revelation given by the Lord of a mystery. When musterion in the Greek is talked about in the New Testament, it means something that was previously hidden and not understood by us, but has been revealed by God now and is to be shared and um, understood by God's people. And Paul explains why it is that the Romans needed to know this. The last thing that Paul wanted is for them to get a big head. So this revelation is not intended to make them think themselves even more privileged and special for having received it. There is a danger, Paul says here, in being ignorant. I do not want you to be uninformed. I do not want you to be ignorant. So that you will not be wise in your own estimation. Paul explains why he's telling this mystery. He's concerned that the Romans not be wise in their own estimation. We all have a tendency towards an unfair appraisal of ourselves. We all have a tendency to grade on the curve when it re relates to ourselves. Right? Very critical of others, but we always give ourselves lots and lots of grace. Right? We often think more highly of ourselves than is fitting. Pride and arrogance are always repulsive, but it's especially repulsive when it derives from a place of utter ignorance. There are a few things that are less appealing than an ignorant, arrogant buffoon, yeah. right? It's one thing to find somebody who's arrogant, and it, and it might be one of those cases where you're like, well, the guy actually is pretty intelligent and pretty smart and still not very enjoyable to be around the individual. But there's something of a whole nother nature, right? To find an ignorant person who is arrogant. Or a person who parades themselves as if they know everything when they know very little. Those people are very, very difficult to get along with. And sadly, perhaps maybe we have ourselves have fallen into that category a time or two. The scriptures are clear regarding how the Lord hates pride. We've been looking at the book of Proverbs, and just this last week we saw Proverbs 8, 12, and 13. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. I find knowledge and discretion. So notice the companions of wisdom are prudence and knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth, I hate. Wisdom hates arrogance and pride and evil ways and perverted mouths. Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Proverbs 26, 12, do, not, do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. James 4, 6, God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Paul is concerned that the Gentiles here that he's addressing not become boastful, not become arrogant. He's concerned that they not have a false estimation of things. And what is the solution? What is the antidote to this? He tells them that they not be ignorant. 
If you understood something, this would lead you not to boast because you'd know things are right. But in your ignorance, you're thinking not properly about how things are. True knowledge and wisdom lead to humility because as we come to appreciate the world around us and the spiritual blessings that are found in the gospel, we're led to see just how little we actually know and we're put in further awe of God and his work and his power. This is what's so sad about when increased knowledge leads to arrogance and boasting and pride. It's completely the opposite of what should happen. Note here the humility that is fostered by mystery, the humility that is fostered by, minis- by, mis- by the mystery. Paul declares here this coming reality with the in- immediate desire that would have the effect of humbling Gentile hearts. Yes, it was a glorious reality of the gospel that Gentiles had been brought near. Those who were not the people of God had been made the people of God. Those who had not received mercy and were without hope and without God in the world had now received mercy and been given hope and right standing with God. This is absolutely glorious. But Paul shares this revelation so the Gentiles would not be fools thinking that they had themselves now replaced the Jews as God's people. Nope. Paul says, in fact, adopting the right perspective of redemptive history should lead the Gentiles not to arrogance and pride, but humility and gratitude. This is what the impact of Revelation is meant to have on we who are God's people. Remember, we only know what we know because God willed to reveal it to us. And so we ought to be led to gratitude and humility, not arrogance and pride. Now, we live in a world that's kind of strange where if you say something with confidence and boldness, often they'll call that pride. Speaking God's word with confidence and boldness is not pride. That's humility. It's submitting ourselves to what God's word has said. That's good. But we all know that there's a place in which human sinfulness can kind of mess up the works, such that the things that we know now start to come across as if we're arrogant about these things. And that is certainly a problem If we read the Bible in order to become trivia experts and boast about the amount of verses we've memorized or questions we can answer or, or, you know, herald ourselves as Bible answer people, we do not know as we ought to know. Wednesday night we mentioned James 3 and the difference between wisdom from above and wisdom from below. Wisdom from above is seen in the fruit that comes from it. It's righteousness sown in peace by those who make peace. It's pure and peaceable and gentle and reasonable and full of mercy and good fruits and unwavering without hypocrisy. But meanwhile, wisdom that's not from above, so therefore wisdom which comes from below, is earthly, natural, demonic. It has jealousy and selfish ambition and disorder in every evil thing. Has what you know of God's revelation led you to humility? Has it led you to peaceableness and gentleness and mercy and good fruits? If so, then you're receiving wisdom from above. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank him for what he's given you. But if on the other hand, if the knowledge you've amassed has led you to become arrogant and proud and boastful, then you better check the sender. Who sent that to me? Where did it come from? Because it might be wisdom from below that you're listening to. You see, God's revelation is meant to curb human pride. It tells us enough that it's clear that God has called what's going to happen before it happens. So when it happens, it'll be clear to us like, oh, God called it. But he doesn't tell us so much detail such that we would sit back on our laurels and claim that we know it all. Become arrogant and pride and boastful. Prideful and boastful. So Paul reveals God's marvelous redemptive plan to check pride and encourage humility. But these words also function as point to a revelation that fosters hope. So Paul is saying this in order to, again, pastorally guide the Gentiles not to a position of arrogance or pride, but instead humility. But notice also that in these words, there's a tremendous amount of hope. Look at verse 25 in the middle there. Israel has been hardened in part. Here's the present situation. Here's the present situation. Porosis, a hardening, word in Greek, obtuseness of discernment, mental dullness, blindness. What is meant by this hardening in part? Certainly it doesn't mean that all the Jews have been partially hardened. 
<laughs> Every single Israelite partially hardened. That's not the point that's being made throughout this. This is God's judicial punishment rendering people spiritually insensitive. And so this isn't like Paul had a little bit of hardening and everybody else had a little bit of hardening. No, the, the hardening in part cannot refer to every Israelite being hardened because it's been very clear that this is a punitive act on those who do not believe in Christ. They've been rendered spiritually dull, spiritually insensitive, spiritually unreceptive to the truth. Now, it could mean that part of Israel had been hardened. And that's certainly true. It, but it's not new information to the story. That's already been well established. As a matter of fact, it's plainly evident that, that some Israelites were hardened to the gospel. For those reasons, since he says here, I don't want you to be uninformed about this reality, it's more likely that Paul's point here is a consideration of ethnic Israel as a whole. And he's talking about this partial hardening or this hardening in part in reference to the present time. He's making a distinction between the present and the future. There's been a hardening in part right now. In other words, this was not a total hardening because it's not an irreversible condition for the nation. Further supporting this position is the next phrase, which points to the revelation that's being declared here. The hardening is limited in what way? How is it a partial hardening? It's limited in scope. We already knew that. Not every Jew was hardened. There were Jews that believed in Jesus. So we know that's already limited in scope, but it's also limited in time. There's a temporal scope to this. It's limited in time. Why? Consider the future glory. Look at verse 25, the rest of it. Until, see that word there? Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Here we have a temporal adjective until which time of the incoming of the Gentiles or the fullness of the incoming of the Gentiles or the fullness of the entering Gentiles. Until implies that the hardening in part will be lifted in the future. There has been a hardening in part until the fullness of the Gentiles have entered. That word enter makes us think of passages like Romans 9 or Mark 9 when Jesus is talking individuals and he says if your hand causes you to stumble cut it off it's better you for you to enter life as a cripple than having two hands go to hell if your foot causes you to stumble cut it off it's better for you to enter life lame than have two feet and be cast into hell if your eye causes you to stumble throw it out it's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than two having two be cast into hell the phrase here enter the Gentiles entering in coming in is a reference to their salvation and this is kind of the, this marvelous mystery that is being unpacked to us, is that God in his redemptive purposes and plan had ordered the order of gospel proclamation. The proclamation of the gospel went to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. But notice that the order of gospel reception is flip-flop. The Gentiles receive it more first, the Jews later. The gospel is delivered to the Jews and then the Gentiles, but the order of gospel reception is the Gentiles first and then the Jews. And all of this is according to God's sovereign plan of redemption. And then we get to this phrase in verse 26, which no small amount of ink has been spilled <laughs> writing on what this phrase means. And so all Israel will be saved. And so all Israel will be saved. So who is Israel? Israel. Um, there was a contingent of people in history, some in the early church, there's a, there's a group of them, especially down, around the time of the Reformation, that argue that Israel here is a reference to all Christians. So Jews and Gentiles alike are brought into this term, all Israel will be saved. Calvin said, I extend the word Israel to the people of God. Paul intended here to set forth the completion of the kingdom of Christ, which is by no means to be confide, uh, confined to the Jews, but is to include the whole world. And I absolutely agree with Calvin that God's redemptive plan was not only for Israel, but also for the whole world. That's all being established here. The question is, does this word Israel here mean that? Consider, for example, Galatians 6.16 
There we have this phrase, the Israel of God. The Israel of God. There is a case there where Israel is being utilized to refer to the church. The Israel of God is Israel and Gentiles, all the people of God. Um, we see similar statements in Galatians 3.29 or Romans 4.13-18 4, 4, uh, where the church is referred to as Abraham's seed. We are all the Israel of God. So that's not without precedent. There's a reason why Calvin and others point to this and go like, oh, and all Israel is saved. That means the whole church, everybody is saved. The only issue here is, is that Paul's intention for the word Israel in this text? I'm not arguing that it could mean that. It could mean that. It could. I'm not arguing against that is what I'm saying. It could mean that. But does it mean it here? The word Israel is used 10 times in Romans 9 through 11. And every single time it refers to ethnic Israel. See Romans 9, 6, 27, 31, 10, 19, 10, 21, 11, 2, 11, 7, 11, 25. In all those cases, it's always a reference to even, even when it's referring to uh, not all Israel or Israel, in both those cases, they're still talking about Jews. <laughs> they're just saying there's a spiritual Israel and a not spiritual Israel. There's ethnic Israel there and spiritual Israel. But even there, they're referring to Jewish people. Mount said this, earlier commentators tended to take all Israel to mean spiritual Israel, that is all believers, Jew and Gentile alike. But throughout this entire section, Paul has been comparing Gentile and Jew as separate ethnic groups. It would have been highly unlikely for him to have blurred the crucial distinction when it came time for a summarizing conclusion. I agree. So another way we could take it is that Israel maybe is a reference to the elect within Israel. Not all are Israel, the nation who are Israel, the elect. Again, go back to 9.6, Romans 9.6. But this requires, again, a shift in meaning from verse 25 to verse 26. Notice there that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel will be saved. So, again, if Israel is the elect, then you're also making a reference here to hardened Israelites in the present. And I have issue with that. So, the other option is that this is a reference to the nation of Israel. And this has its own sub-points, sub-potentials. It could be every Israelite throughout history. So some people could argue it doesn't matter what happened with the Israelites, all of them are ultimately going to be saved. And I would disagree with that. Those, those Jews who rejected Jesus and died in that unbelief are going to hell. Just like Gentiles who reject Jesus and die in unbelief will go to hell. So I disagree with that's every Israelite throughout history. There are others who would, uh, these next two positions, it's, you know, I could go either way. There's some who argue every Israelite alive at the Perusia, every Israelite, so every Jew who's alive when Jesus returns, all of them will be saved. West reads it this way, Paul means the individual salvation of each member of the nation of Israel living at the time of the second advent. He quotes Zechariah 13.1 and the national restoration of the Messianic kingdom. MacArthur takes it similarly, must be taken to mean just that, the entire nation that survives God's judgment during the Great Tribulation. Again, obviously also noting eschatological schemes there, right? This comes into some of this discussion for sure. The other way you can understand this is that it's a reference to Israel as a whole near the end. In other words, it's not a reference to every single individual's part of the nation. The text does not say every Israelite. Instead, it says all Israel, meaning a large representative number. Kind of like saying that all the, the fullness of the Gentiles, does that mean every Gentile? No, not every Gentile, but the ones that God has chosen to save. When all of those are brought in, then all Israel will also be saved. People have made allusions to things like, if I was to say, the whole city came to the Astros game last night. You know, I mean, again, I don't mean every single individual is there, but such a representative sample that it felt like everybody was there, this kind of idea. And there's many commentators that go that direction. Bruce among them who said, the existence of the believing remnant is the earnest of the final salvation of all Israel. All Israel is a recurring expression in Jewish literature. It need not mean every Jew without a single exception, but Israel as a whole. What is it that's being described that's happening to all Israel? All Israel will be saved. Note here, and the following quotations make clear that the prophetic word here is that Israel will be saved. Salvation is coming. 
This is not speaking of the reestablishment of a modern nation of Israel. It's speaking about a dramatic salvation of Israel by God, fulfilling his ancient promise to them. Salvation by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. This also makes plain that Israel will be saved in the same manner as the Gentiles. There are some who have argued that Jews will now be saved at the end time. They'll be saved through the Old Covenant by keeping the Mosaic Law. Like somehow God's going to have a bi-covenantal relationship where Jews are saved through Mosaic keeping and, and Gentiles are saved through Christ. That's hogwash. <laughs> but everything that Paul has talked about throughout the entire book of Romans speaks against that. We can't keep the Mosaic legislation. We can't keep the law. Christ is the end of the law for everyone who believes. The only hope of these Jews being saved is that they repent and believe in Jesus. Just like the only hope for all Gentiles is to repent and believe in Jesus. So that's absolutely wrong. Anyone who puts that forward, please, please, you know, graciously um, and forcefully correct them on this. There's certainly no place for people being saved through the old covenant. You need Jesus. You need the new covenant. Notice even this passage, there's only one tree by which everyone has to be grafted into in order to enjoy eternal life. Jews are being grafted in, cannot persist in unbelief. Notice, he can graft them in if they don't persist in unbelief. They must not persist in unbelief in order to be grafted back in. So what is God going to do? He's going to remove their unbelief. <laughs> He's going to grant them faith. He's going to grant them belief. And they'll believe in Jesus and they'll be grafted in. And note by the following references that he quotes from the Old Testament, which we'll look at in just a minute. You see the discussion of forgiveness of sins and removing ungodliness, all part of what the gospel does. So, so this is the point I want to make here. There have been eschatological statements that have been made from this passage, and I would just say, whatever your eschatology, that does not determine this passage, because this passage is talking about spiritual salvation, the rescue of, of these Jews. It's not talking about nations being set up and any of the rest of that. We can still have disagreements about where we land on those things. This is talking about their spiritual salvation, not about these other things. Moose said, the present situation in salvation history is which, in which so few Jews are being saved cannot finally do justice to the scriptural expectations about Israel's future. Something more is to be expected. And this more, Paul implies, is a large-scale conversion of Jewish people at the end of this age through faith in Jesus. Schreiner said it this way, God has designed salvation history in such a way that his grace comes as a surprise to those who are its recipients. Gentiles are saved when Jews expected it as special objects of his favor, and Jews are saved when Gentiles are tempted to believe that they're superior to ethnic Israel. God inverts human expectations. Love it. Why does God do that? So he receives all the glory. Let's lastly look at the, the past prophecy here in verses 26 and 27. Paul, again, is doing something that he has been doing <laughs> throughout Romans, and that is he makes statements, and then he points to the Old Testament and says, look, this is in keeping with what God has prophesied and the patterns that are set down in redemptive history. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. This is a combined quotation. It's a little bit of Isaiah. It's mostly Isaiah 59, 20 and 21, which we had read. There's also a little bit of an indication of Isaiah 27, 9 here. And also, as we had read, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. In Isaiah 59, two actions are being taken by God against rebellious Israel. The context of Isaiah 59, Israel is rebellious. <laughs> Israel is not doing what they're supposed to. And what does God do through, through the prophet Isaiah? He rebukes them. He scolds them for their transgressions. And then he promises to redeem them. <laughs> he tells them, you are wicked. You are unrighteous. Where should I look? Oh, guess what? I'll provide what is needed. I'll provide a deliverer. I'll provide a messiah. I'll ensure the establishment of an everlasting covenant with you. Not because you deserve it, but because I'm gracious. That's what Isaiah 59 talks about. God distinctly claims for himself a certain people, and he effectively redeems them. In other words, salvation is not depending on Israel deciding to come back, but on God's decision to bring them back to himself. Just like God made a decision to include Gentiles to bring us in so he can choose to bring Israel 
his people back to himself. Notice the description here, the removal of ungodliness, the removal of sin from Jacob. So while God's covenant has been fulfilled in God's provision of Jews and Gentiles entering through Christ, Paul suggests that the covenant still awaits a further and final consummation. And what Paul answers here is, when is it going to happen? When the fullness of the Gentiles have come in, that's when that's going to happen. And how is it going to happen? By Israel's acceptance of the gospel message about forgiveness found in Jesus Christ. Jesus will remove Israel's unbelief and grant them faith. I'll give an extended quote from Lloyd-Jones because it's so good. He points out that we who read the Bible should see this pattern. This pattern has already been well established. God was there, as it were, casting away his people in the Old Testament. And many of the nations jumped to the conclusion that they were finished, that Israel was finished as God's people. Their land was desolate. There they were in captivity. They had no army. They had nothing at all. But you see, God had not finished with them. They were still his people. So God, in his own miraculous manner, brought them back to Palestine, into the very city of Jerusalem, which was rebuilt. God did that in the Old Testament. Now then, what the apostle is saying is, as God did that with his covenant people in the Old Testament, he's going to do that again. He has for a time being again sent them off to, to a kind of captivity. He has broken them off of the olive tree. He has cast them aside. But it is not permanent. Do not come to that conclusion. He is going to do again in this matter of salvation and the church exactly what he did with them under the Old Testament dispensation. The point that Paul's drawing here is like what we see in bits and pieces in a pattern set up in the Old Testament with Israel rejecting God, rejecting his prophets, rejecting the word of God, as a result being deported from their land and all the rest, and then God graciously bringing them back and setting them back up. That pattern we see established in the Old Testament, Paul's just saying he's going to do it again at the end of consummation of history. He's going to do it in this glorious way where their present rejection is meaning the inclusion of an incredible number of Gentiles, people of every tribe, tongue, and nation. And at the very end, when he's brought all those people in, then all Israel will be brought in. In this glorious crescendo to human history. Pastor Christian sent me uh, the following quote from Thomas Schreiner. He was reading a commentary in Galatians and came across it, sent it to me, and I completely agree with you, Christian. This is just fantastic. This is kind of summarizing what we talked about last week and this week. He says this, Paul promises that there is a future end time salvation of ethnic Israel. Does such a promise contradict what Paul teaches in Galatians and in Ephesians, where the church of Jesus Christ consists of both Jews and Gentiles united in Christ? See Ephesians 2. Does Paul inconsistently reintroduce a special place for Israel after repudiating such in Galatians? Is Israel promised a salvation apart from the gospel? The answer to all of these questions is no. The future salvation does not of Israel does not contradict the unity of Jews and Gentiles in Christ. For Jews who are saved become part of the church of Christ. When Jews put their faith in Jesus Christ, they do not become part, uh, part of a new entity, but belong to the new assembly of the redeemed along with their Gentile brothers and sisters. That middle wall of separation has been broken down. We're all one in Christ. And this assembly is one that Paul wishes for Gentiles to keep in mind and to live in light of. The church is made up of Jews and Gentiles. And God is at work through all the twists and turns of salvation history to save his people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. So what's our takeaway? How, what are we supposed to, how are we supposed to respond to this text? Again, these are the two words I want you to take with you today. One is humility. Let us be humble and grateful as we consider that God saved us and brought us into this marvelous relationship with himself. We have a standing with God through faith that was itself a gift from God, such that we have no place to boast, and certainly not boasting over the Jewish people. The other is that we should have hope. Hope that God is saving all of his people among the nations and also that God is not through with Israel. 
that there's going to be this glorious crescendo to all of history. You know, contrary to a lot of people who think, you know, the world is just cyclical and just going through its cycles and, you know, it's knows, who knows where it's going. There's a beginning and end to the story. And God is the master storyteller. Every story can just pales in comparison with the story of redemption. And at the end of this story, we're getting just a little glimpse here in Romans 11. Paul says to the Gentiles, don't become boastful. God's not done with Israel yet. He's not completely done with them now. There's still Jews that are believing in Jesus. But at the end, when he's brought in all these people, tribe, tongue, and nation, he's also at the very end of this crescendo going to bring in all Israel. Our responsibility, therefore, is to continue to herald the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're called to tell sinners, both Jews and Gentiles, that they need to repent and believe in Jesus. For it's only through Christ that ungodliness can be removed and our sins can be forgiven and we be ushered into eternal life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your marvelous word and thank you for giving us insights into what you're up to. You didn't have to, but you did so in order to curb our tendency towards pride and arrogance. Help us to be a grateful and humble people Thank you that you are able to save. That you're, you're strong to save. While we are not owed salvation, what we are owed is judgment and death and hell. You're not only just, but you're also merciful and gracious. And through your son Jesus, there is offered to us salvation. Lord, we would be remiss today if we didn't appeal before your throne, asking that you would even save souls in this room right now. We beg, Lord, that you would be pleased to open blind eyes, break up hardened hearts, open deaf ears, that they would hear the gospel and receive Jesus Christ. They would recognize their sinfulness I recognize that their only hope of forgiveness is to trust in Jesus who died on the cross and rose again, paying the penalty for sinners who trust in him. Lord, thank you for your marvelous grace and mercy and thank you for allowing us the privilege of getting a glimpse into coming attractions. We glory in you. Our hope is you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.